it's uh, it's rare, I guess, in some ways, to uh, to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. See. <laughs> Many of you know, many of you know Joe. He's our, uh, our beloved pastor here, the founding pastor of Westminster Chapel, and the founder of the Ezra Institute for Contemporary Christianity. Uh, prior to that, he served as the Canadian director with uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries um, here in Canada, and for a time before that in the UK as well. That probably accounts for his accent. Um, Joe earned his PhD in Christian Intellectual Thought from Whitfield Theological Seminary in Florida, and he is a cultural theologian, um, uniquely qualified to speak on matters like this. Uh, his most recent works are Gospel Culture, as he's mentioned. That's a, uh, that's a short book that I'd urge you to pick up and read if you haven't read it already. And uh, Mission of God, which is a... Uh, a much larger book that I'd also encourage you to get together and read, but uh, start with gospel culture, maybe. And from, uh, from what I've been told from yesterday, his, uh, his midfielding skills are pa passable? Outstanding. Outsta okay. Please welcome Joe Boot. Well, thank you, everyone. The uh, theme that I've been asked to address today is the gospel and our culture, crisis and hope. It was uh, commenting on the uh, life and work of uh, Nietzsche that uh, G.K. Chesterton said, uh, the man who thinks without proper first principles goes mad. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Nietzsche did actually uh, go insane. Madness would uh, seem to be, for many Christians anyway, the uh, right term to describe the direction of our culture uh, today. Our first principles for the direction of culture have certainly ceased to be the word of God. And not only has that word been jettisoned increasingly by the culture, it's being jettisoned to a degree by the church itself. And in its place, uh, human will, human ideas are allowed to rule and define not only the meaning of truth and justice, but thereby the direction of culture. Recently, I wrote an article for the 150th uh, anniversary celebrations of Canada uh, for Jubilee, which is coming out very soon. And in it, I analyzed the thought of the Canadian philosopher George Grant. Uh, George Grant actually understood the cultural situation of the West quite well. And one of the people who analyzed his thought, uh, Hugh Donald Forbes, uh, he describes uh, Grant's uh, perspective on the culture. He said this, justice is understood to be something strictly human, having nothing to do with obedience to any divine command or conformity to any pattern laid up in heaven. Moral principles, like all other social conventions, are something made on earth. Human freedom requires that the principles of justice be the product of human agreement or consent. That is, they must be the result of a contract. The terms of the contract may well change as circumstances and interests change, but the restraints free individuals accept must always be horizontal in character rather than vertical. So what he's saying there is that what's happened culturally over, especially over the past 60 years or so, is that we've rejected vertical accountability for a kind of horizontal relativity. It's just an updatable contract. That's all, that's the way we think about society, uh, especially um, political society. It's just an updatable contract, and that contract can change, can be modified with time. And this means that we have seen uh, people beginning to, modern man beginning to confer on himself a whole plethora of rights. That would have seemed very strange to even our grandparents' generation. For example, the right to redefine your gender irrespective of your chromosomes. The right to murder 
uh, abortion or euthanasia, for example, the right to polygamy, to homosexuality, to bestiality, almost to any sexual predilection, the right to suicide, the right to euthanize children, the elderly, the sick, as we've seen in Europe, but recently here in Canada, all our laws against euthanasia and assisted suicide struck down. The right to a homosexual marriage, in inverted commas, the right to prostitution and pornography, the right to, to suppress the free speech of the Christian church, the right to blasphemy and endless other violations of God's law. And all of this is actually dressed up in the garb of human dignity and human freedom. But actually, it's simply radical autonomy. I think that's a fairly accurate summary of where we are in many respects as a culture. So I think it's uncontroversial to say that actually the ground beneath our feet has been shifting. The moral principles beneath our feet have been shifting. And that's produced a kind of metamorphosis in the church's relationship to the culture. The church Christians are kind of scrambling, trying to navigate and decide how they're going to relate to this new culture. In fact, it seems that uh, in many cases, the church is a uh, complicit uh, not just complicit, sometimes even a driving force in the spirit of compromise and accommodation. So that you have liberalizers in both evangelical and mainline denominations who actually like to publish their apostasy to the world. They seem to equate media coverage and interest from an acceptability in the culture with acceptability to God, with something that God himself will now approve of because Perhaps CNN approves of it. And so uh, the, our understanding of both the nature and the relationship of the gospel to our culture has never been more important. And yet it's an area of profound confusion. What is the relationship of our gospel to the culture in which we live? A good place to start thinking about that would be to consider the meaning of culture itself. Culture is a an overused word today is business culture, arts culture, political culture. Um, every kind of uh, uh, social association somehow is now become a culture, subcultures. But actually, the uh, word culture is best understood as the public manifestation of the worship of a people. In fact, uh, my favorite definition of culture was by Henry Van Til. He defined it this way, that culture is religion externalized. Religion externalized. Now, I uh, think, just take that word culture for a moment. Our English word culture, uh, a similar word, agriculture. And uh, we, we note immediately that there is a root, there is a root word, here's a root, a Latin root word for both culture and agriculture that we use today. And uh, there's a direct association still for us with another word, cultus, cultus, which means worship. And that's uh, the most direct connection of culture with worship is still with us in the, in the word cult. We talk about the cult. Um, we will often refer to things like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth as cults. They're forms of worship. Culture then is a, a state of being that is being cultivated by intellectual and moral tilling in terms of a prevailing cultus. So you have a prevailing cultus, you have a prevailing kind of worship, and then there is a, an intellectual and moral tilling that happens that goes on in terms of that cult or cultus, which begins to form a type of civilization. It's important to uh, note as well that this um, cultus is communitarian. It's not something that's purely individual. It's transmitted to people through the family, through their education, through law, through the arts, through various other institutions shaping our cultural life. So actually, um, it's something that for many of us goes on quite unconsciously, that we, we are being shaped in terms of the prevailing cultus around us. 
The Dutch Christian philosopher Herman Doeverd, he pointed out, he said, and I quote, the religious ground motive of a culture can never be ascertained from the ideas and the personal faith of the individual. It is truly a communal motive that governs the individual, even when one is not consciously aware of or acknowledges it. So all culture is actually the expression, I'm defining it as the expression of the worship of the people by which they cultivate their society. So let's land that kind of abstract notion of culture into some very real uh, illustrations. So take for example, Saudi Arabia or Syria or Pakistan. If you go to those countries, you will experience Islamic culture. That's the culture that you will encounter in those countries. Uh, it's expressed in everything uh, in a place like Pakistan, for example, in their dress, in their diet, in the laws, in the calls to prayer that you hear uh, going out across the city, in its art, in everything. You see the, the religion of Islam expressed through the culture in those countries. If you go to many of the major cities of India, uh, you will still experience Hindu culture. It's there in the dress. It's there in the temples. Yes, it's there in the diet. It's there even in the surnames of Indian people, uh, defining or at least um, indicating which uh, caste their families are from. If you go to North Korea or to China, uh, you will encounter Marxist-oriented cultures. And very clearly, um, those cultures, the, 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 those uh, philosophies, I should say, express themselves then in how people think and act in those cultures. So, if you came to the West today uh, as somebody who was an outsider, uh, how would you describe uh, a place like Canada or the United Kingdom or France. If you came to the West, actually what really you encounter today increasingly is a humanistic, secular culture, deeply influenced by pagan spirituality, which at the same time displays the cultural vestiges of Christianity. We still display cultural, cultural vestiges of our faith because you go around a place like Toronto, for example, and there are churches in every neighborhood, more than one. Typically, it was called Toronto the Good, the city of churches. You see uh, uh, scriptural texts in the Peace Tower there in Ottawa. Uh, you still find in our language, in our laws, vestiges of this. But actually, in, when you look at the common life of the people, it's increasingly secular and humanistic. So that's the meaning of culture. When we think, though, about the direction of culture, let's go back to Scripture and think about what Scripture understands by culture. When we, when we think in biblical categories, culture is what human beings make of God's creation. Culture is what human beings do and make of God's creation. This is what our first parents were actually set in the garden of God to do as a royal priesthood. They were, they were royal priests. They were a kingly priesthood. They were set in this cosmic temple of uh, the, the garden of Eden in the, in the earth. In fact, uh, the temple itself, the, the temple among the Israelites was a copy of Eden. It was an expression of that. There you have this first cosmic temple and their calling was to subdue and develop everything in creation under God to turn creation into a God-glorifying culture, cultivating everything in terms of his will and purpose as an act of worship. So creation didn't come to our first parents shrink-wrapped and microwavable as though they didn't have anything to do. In fact, they were set in the garden to tend the garden and then to develop the resources of the earth. And human beings are doing that all of the time and we've been doing it throughout history. The uh, Reformed theologian Herman Bavinck, he put it this way. He says, Genesis 1.26 teaches that God had a purpose in creating man in his image, namely that man should have dominion. Now, if we comprehend the force of this subduing, that is dominion, under the term culture, we can say that culture in its broadest sense is the purpose for which God created man 
after his image. It's quite a thought, isn't it? The purpose for which God created man after his image was actually culture. Culture making is actually inescapable for all of God's image bearers. Every single one of us is making culture every day in everything that we are doing. Human beings will actually turn the visible and invisible materials of God's creation into a culture in one of two ways, either as covenant keepers or as covenant breakers as we stand in relationship to God. We are either going to be obedient or disobedient. And that this means there's a, an antithesis that we see around us in cultural life. This is what Christians are struggling with all of the time. We find that there is two fundamental directions. The antithesis is something that actually scripture very clearly teaches. Paul in Romans 1 is very explicit that there are ultimately, when you boil it all down, there are ultimately only two types of culture possible. There are actually two directions for culture possible that express themselves in a multiple of types, but there's only two directions. These alternatives are actually mutually exclusive. Paul says there is the worship of the creator or is the worship of the creation. It's actually quite simple. So in all the complexity of culture making, there is either the worship of the creator or there is the worship of creation. The worship of any aspect of creation in the Bible is called idolatry and it leads to social decay. So what we can deduce from what Paul teaches about the nature of culture, and he talks first in Romans 1 there about false worship, uh, so that we, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and then worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And then he goes on to, to show how there are cultural implications for that. His main illustration is actually in sexuality in culture, how that gets expressed. But any uh, worship of the creation, visible or invisible, is called idolatry. And that means that there is no neutral approach to culture. And this is absolutely critical. What scripture makes very plain, if we can only worship and serve the creator or the creature, there's only two possible directions, and therefore there is no neutral culture. No institution, no cultural activity can ever be religiously neutral. This is why Paul can actually say, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, in other words, in the most mundane things in life, do it all for the glory of God. Now, Christians, of course, who worship the creator, and let's take Canada as an example, uh, secular humanists who deny the creator and worship one or more aspects of the creation, of course, we pursue many of the same cultural tasks. Most of you here will have a job and various colleagues and you're doing the same work uh, day to day as perhaps the person sitting next to you at the desk or working with you uh, in the landscape gardening firm or whatever it is that we may do. Both uh, Christians and non-Christians get married and build families. Uh, both Christians and non-Christians establish educational institutions. They produce artwork, they make films, they write music. So what's the difference? The difference is that although the structure in which we are operating is the same, the direction of what we're doing is different. So, for example, take music. The Christian and the non-Christian musician are using the same notes. There aren't a Christian set of scales and a non-Christian set of scales, right? The musical notations are the same for both. But if you listen to a piece of music by... My favorite composer would be Johann Sebastian Bach, and perhaps my least favorite would be John Cage, um, who, well, uh, sometimes he will sit down in silence at the piano for 10 minutes and then get up, and that's supposed to be really deep. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the difference is not that the musical notation is different, but the direction of the music is different, structure and direction. The structure of something concerns God's creational laws and ordained pattern that pertain to it. So, for example, the family, the church, the state, these are structures uh, that God has created, and uh, those structures, those norms are the same for everybody. Whereas the direction of these spheres concerns the religious orientation uh, that they have. 
Now, there are many structures within God's creation, but there's only these two directions. We're either oriented towards God in our marriage, in family, in church, in state, in art, in science, or we're oriented towards idolatry. And so we'll either seek to serve and glorify God, or our lives will move in what uh, we can call an apostate direction. That means actually the Christians, uh, the, the Christian faith, the biblical faith, we have the thesis. We are seeking to live and work in terms of God's thesis for creation. The non-believer is working in an antithetical direction in everything. That's really the nature of apostasy. Now, I know that very, very important distinction between structure and direction because... We as Christians recognize a theological reality called the fall, the fall, the problem of sin. And sin is something that affects all institutions and all human activities. That's what uh, the reformer John Calvin called total depravity. It means that our, our sins affect every aspect of our life. Regarding marriage, for example, uh, the God-ordained structure for marriage is exactly the same now as it was at creation. When Jesus teaches about the nature of marriage, he doesn't appeal to the present culture of the Greco-Roman world. He says, from the beginning of creation. So the structure of marriage is the same, but the direction of the hearts of those in the marriage relationship when the unregenerate can be turned in an apostate, rebellious direction. And the same is true of political life. It's not that God's ordained structure of the state is somehow broken when we see a mess in the state. The problem is that those involved in politics of hearts and convictions committed to ideologies that are hostile towards God and his word. So when we hear people opine, for example, that their marriage failed, uh, we know what they mean. But it wasn't actually marriage that failed. It was the people within the marriage that, that, that was the re reason the marriage broke down. It wasn't that God's institution of marriage has failed. So to um, think about this problem, we do need to consider these issues of structure and direction. Failed states don't lead us to conclude that God's ordination of the role of the state is at fault. Rather, those involved, the state actors involved, uh, led to the decay or the collapse of the state. And what this means is actually that the socio-cultural and political challenges that we see around us are at root, at root, religious, moral challenges centered in the heart of the human person. That's what they are at root. These are the problems. Now, let's think about now the transformation of culture, uh, especially the gospel culture syllogism, as I call it, that I've written about in my book, Gospel Culture. If we accept what uh, I've talked about there, uh, about the nature of culture and uh, the uh, nature of uh, the gospel, that Christ is Lord of all, and uh, that he has come to restore us to the worship of the living God, then actually it becomes implicit that the Christian gospel has a particular kind of vision for culture. The gospel actually is a culture because it's centered in the worship of the living God through the person of Christ who is enthroned as Lord over our heart, mind, soul, and strength of every single believer. So that the gospel forms a new culture, that's an inescapable deduction from the meaning of both terms. And that's why I actually called this lecture gospel culture. Not the gospel and culture, but gospel culture. If culture is the public expression of the worship of a people and the gospel restores us to true worship that is of our creator and redeemer not of the creation then the gospel restores us to true culture which the bible calls the kingdom of god the gospel restores us to our calling to worship and to serve, and it begins with the regeneration of our hearts, which then affects this radical change in every aspect of our lives and being. Now, if that is true, and I believe it is, that the gospel affects that kind of a great transformation in us, then actually when we look at the state of our culture today, we have to take some measure of responsibility as Christian people ourselves for the condition of our age. 
that the church, the Christian church and the Christian family have to some extent abandoned or surrendered our callings. Since the uh, so-called Enlightenment, a period that was named by humanists, of course, Christians have steadily surrendered the various organs of culture, education, the arts, charity, law, medicine, government, almost entirely to secularism, to humanism. We have steadily retreated into a kind of pietistic bubble that is concerned almost exclusively with keeping souls from hell and have limited Christ's jurisdiction to the institutional church. The result has been the marginalization of the Christian church and a change of religion in the public space. Because of what I've said about culture, you can't actually ever disestablish religion from a culture and, or from the state. You can, you can distinguish between the spheres of the church and the state, but you cannot disestablish religion from the state. The state and political life will always be oriented, directed towards God, the living God, or in some other direction. Some freedoms for the gospel remain, of course, in our time, but freedoms not fought for are soon forfeited. So if we actually love God and our neighbor, we are going to be concerned with the advancement of a full-orbed gospel culture for all of life, not just our own personal inner piety. We're going to want to witness to the reality of this cosmos renewing gospel and call people and nations to repentance, to the life, the joy, the beauty and truth that is found in Christ alone and his rule. Now you might say to me, well, this is all very grand, Joe, but where are the biblical illustrations of really cultures being changed by God's word? outside of, say, the people of Israel and the church, the church institute. Well, actually, when you look at Scripture carefully, you'll find that the Bible is filled with accounts of God's servants confronting sin, confronting idolatry and false worship, and actually transforming kings and kingdoms and cultures with the truth. Think about these few examples for a moment. Moses had the temerity, he needed some encouragement, of course, but he finally had the temerity to confront the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Now, you, you couldn't say that that was purely a religious church institutional matter. The exodus of an entire people out of Egypt. That affected the economy, the politics, every aspect of Egypt's life was affected by that. So he had the temerity to confront Pharaoh, and he didn't complain to God that spiritual leaders didn't have the authority to confront political leaders. They should just be concerned with spiritual matters. Nathan had the, the, the prophet Nathan had the gall to confront King David about his adultery. Elijah confronted Ahab for his lawlessness. And what about this one? My favorite. Daniel confronted the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar until he acknowledged, quote, the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was actually converted and he declared of the Lord, quote, his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. That's the king of one of the greatest historical ancient empires the world has ever known. You can think about Joseph also in Egypt. Or what about Jonah? The prophet Jonah at the heart of the Assyrian Empire, Nineveh. His preaching led to citywide repentance from the monarch on down. These weren't Hebrews. These were pagan people. And they repented. Jonah was probably the most ironic evangelist in the history of God's covenant people because he's the only one who was disappointed by a mass revival in a major pagan city. Um, Nehemiah petitioned the king of Persia to return the Jews to Jerusalem and he found favor. John the Baptist confronted King Herod over his abandonment of God's plan for marriage. The Apostle Peter confronted the Jewish Sanhedrin 
And he talked there about the authority of Christ and his determination to obey God rather than men. Paul confronted the Athenian court in uh, Athens on Mars Hill. Felix, Festus, Agrippa with the lordship of Christ and his gospel. Jesus called Herod Antipas a fox as uh, somebody who was a, as, as a deceiver. And he reminded Pontius Pilate that he had no authority over him save what was given him from above. Why would these servants of God and even the Lord himself have bothered engaging with and speaking to these leaders, political leaders of empires, of cultures, to interfere with the life of the nations? Well, they impacted dramatically the culture of their times. Perhaps a clue is found for us in Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord will hold them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You know, one of the fascinating things about a psalm like that, Psalm 2, is there's no indication of a referendum on the identity of the son of God or in his rule and his authority. There's no vote invited. The voice of the people is not the voice of God. God is ruling and reigning through his son. Christ is king, not when or because we accept it. Christ's lordship is total, it's absolute, it's objective reality, irrespective of the desires of people and nations. And actually nowhere will you find in scripture national cultures or rulers or kings or politicians commanded to be neutral or impartial with respect to the claims of God and of his Christ. Somehow, uh, people can think today, even Christians, that rulers and judges and kings are to sit in judgment over God and his word and his law. We have no indication of that in Scripture. Instead, the psalm tells us that all rulers are required to kiss the son, which means to acknowledge his authority and to submit to him. And the word of God is very plain that all things are being made subject to Christ in heaven and in in earth, look at Colossians 1, 15 through 20, for example. And we're actually commanded to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven, right here on earth. Let me summarize what we've said so far then, uh, as we come to consider in a little bit more detail where we are at today. We've seen that Western culture has pursued this course away from the God of Scripture, away from his word revelation. But I've said we haven't ceased to worship. We've exchanged true worship for idolatry and sociocultural life has turned law and pol politics and art and education in an apostate direction. And this change has actually come about through a largely quiet revolution, but the fruits of it are now being very clearly manifest. Let's think about a few of them. First, there's a kind of spiritual nihilism that has gripped our culture today. Under the influence of European radical thinkers like Michel Foucault, we have been told that there is no essential self. The human person and the human family, we're told today, are merely social constructs. The uh, Feminist American Jewish philosopher Judith Butler has told us that even uh, gender and sexuality are fictive. They are merely fictions. They are socially constructed fictions. We are only what we make and define ourselves to be. That's what we're increasingly told. In such a cosmos, even grammar and pronouns become a problem. So in Toronto, for example, a professor 
um, at the University of Toronto refusing to use the new fictive pronouns is in trouble because there can be not even be laws of grammar anymore in a world that is nihilistic, that's jettisoned any of that vertical accountability that we spoke about at the beginning. Here then, human beings are little more than artifice. They're not bound by anything outside of or beyond themselves. Now you contrast that with the foundation of a scriptural philosophy of life. We discover this in God's word revelation, this foundational aspect of granting us a coherent and intelligible vision of the human person. On the one side then, we've uh, no clue anymore about what the human person, the human individual is, but scripture tells us, Genesis 1, 26 through 27, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. Now, it may surprise you to learn that there's actually no parallel to this starting point anywhere else in human thought. This is an unparalleled starting point. The triune God of Scripture creates all things out of nothing, all that is distinct from himself, and he makes the human person as Lord of creation after his image to reflect his will and purpose to creation, where the I, that is the human ego, is established as a kind of trans-temporal reference point for all aspects, all aspects of our experience. What do I mean by that? Well, the human eye, the heart, that person that you talk to in the shower, that you uh, uh, talk to when you're out on a walk, that is always ever present with you, the eye, cannot be reduced to any aspect of created reality. No aspect of your temporal experience can really subsume that eye because the eye is always reflecting on those elements of your temporal experience. Who is the eye that's always reflecting on your experience? We are part of creation, but somehow we transcend creation. It was the French philosopher, Christian philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who understood so well that the human person is a mystery that transcends himself and his environment. We are living integral beings who are actually comprehensible, not when we relate simply to our temporal experience around us, our environment, but only as we have reference back to the living God as the source and origin of life, of law, of truth and meaning. Whenever we try and find the source and root of meaning in our temporal experience, we get all these isms emerging, don't we? You know, rationalism and materialism and existentialism and subjectivism and romanticism, where one aspect of our experience is being kind of absolutized, it's being lifted up and made the explanatory principle for everything else. But actually, when we think about ourselves and the human eye, we can't reduce it to any aspect of our experience. This is a unique human identity and this critically uh, important distinction between the creator and the creature that the Bible gives to us right there in Genesis helps us not only understand our own identity, but it helps us understand the limit to the reach of our thought, the limit to the reach of our legal and legislative prerogatives. My thought, you see, as a human being, is not able to transcend uh, the created order. You see, the philosophers have always been trying to get out of themselves, recon recognizing that there's some kind of trans-temporal, transcendent element to the human person. They've always been trying to um, rise above or get out of somehow uh, creation, absolutize something within it. Their reason, for example. But my reason operates only within the categories that are possible within creation. As soon as I talk beyond that, I start talking gibberish. This is why we need revelation to tell us about who God really is. We read in the book of Ecclesiastes 
As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the woman in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. That's a remarkable text. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. You cannot account for the human person without reference back to God. We've lost sight of that true nature of man today in our fallen condition, and we've fallen prey as a culture to this spiritual nihilism. And our whole generation of young people have been instructed in terms of that spirit. Again, to refer to the Dutch philosopher Herman Doever, a great Christian thinker, he said this regarding modern man. He said, he has lost all his faith and denies any higher ideals than the satisfaction of his desires. To him, God is dead. Modern mass man has lost himself and considers himself cast into a world that is meaningless. Now, of course, a lost world offers no hope for a lost person. And as a result of this modern temper, there's perhaps never been a time, maybe in 15 or 16 centuries, when the Western world has faced a greater crisis of identity, when people are not even sure what a human being is anymore. We are so radically uprooted and adrift as a culture, the cultural philosophers have sp spilt a lot of ink trying to trace this problem, problem upstream back to the source of where we lost our way and various tributaries of it, but they don't all grasp this foundational religious character that undergirds it. They might point to some sociological phenomenon, but they do not see the religious character of the change and the transformation that's taken place, our apostasy from God. That's behind the decline of the human person, the human personality in our age, where we think nothing of aborting the young and killing the elderly. And thinking that the human person is, pl uh, is pliable and plastic. What is man? What is a human being? Well, this radical relativism that is all around us is something that was unimaginable even 25 years ago. Abstracted, generalized people reduced to group identities where we no longer actually know what a human person is. We just have this radical autonomous desire, this subjective self-identification. We're not sure about the worth of the human person at the beginning of their life or at the end of their life. As such, What's broken down is the possibility of differentiation of any objective kind. So <clears throat> when you think that we've reached this, and it would be hilarious if it wasn't so serious, we've reached this point where we can't differentiate between a male and a female, between a man and a woman, between this most basic binary distinction. This is actually what begins to happen in cultural life when philosophically and religiously you've lost the creator-creature distinction and you've lost God's definition of the human person. It's completely logical. We look at it and we say it's insane, but it's perfectly logical for the people who are caught up in it. It makes sense to them because there's no basis at this point for differentiation. In a world mired in the irrational fluidity of all things, where the possibility of dif dif uh, 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 discerning between truth and falsehood, between right and wrong, reality and unreality, it's, everything has collapsed. Especially when you're not even allowed to point out that something is an unreality. When you have to promote the lie. Culture hasn't just reached a bump in the road in our time. It's been sucked into a kind of vortex of democratic insanity. I like that expression. It's mine. You can use it. Feel free to quote it anytime. The stark reality of our situation, actually, is that we're facing the death of man as man. Actually, Francis Schaeffer talked about the loss of the mannishness of man. By debunking and defacing and denying the image of God in man, we're losing our soul. And actually, the, many of this, the, uh, the atheistic philosophers have known that the, uh, the, the, the way to change the culture is actually to deface the image of God in the human person. Because if, to destroy God, you must destroy his image. 
because human beings are a reminder to one another constantly of the nobility of the human person made in the image of God. So if you can deface and destroy that image, you get rid of God. Karl Marx believed that the key to the earthly family, to its destruction, which he was determined to achieve, was the holy family. He said, if you want to get rid of the holy family, you have to destroy the earthly family in theory and in practice. Jesus said, though, what will it profit a person if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? That's just another word in the Bible for the heart. The core. The core of the human person. When iconoclastic and fractious people declare that what is left of human dignity is now rooted solely in radical autonomy from God, from revelation, from actually true human community, from familial and moral obligation. We've really reached a point where atomization and depersonalization has happened in the totality of human life. And there is actually no technical solution to this religious problem. What the modern state is trying to do is to find a technical solution to the problem that it has created. So modern secularism, modern humanism, creates a problem and then looks for a technical solution to solve it by managing and regulating and manipulating scientific manipulation of human society. In the state of crisis that results from the illusion of creative freedom of selfhood, people are actually, though, very afraid inwardly. And if you do any evangelism or you talk to people in the taxi or on the bus or you talk to your neighbors, you actually discover it's tragic. It's tragic to, to actually spend time with lost people. Jenny and I were at a party recently in our neighborhood of friends of Jenny's from the gym. And they're all in their sort of 40s and 50s partying away, trying to recapture their youth, watching some huge U2 thing because U2 had been through town. I, it's fine. I don't mind U2, whatever. But they're half, they're half drunk before we even get there. And then I sit down with one man and he's spinning his conspiracy, conspiracy, his conspiracy theories to me about the world and about everything. Totally lost. And that's normal. There is a deep lostness in the modern person. People deeply inwardly afraid, even as they revel in the autonomy that finds endless social indulgence and increasingly legal sanction. On every side, people are gripped by fear and by guilt and by despair. And no amount of psychotropic prescriptions from the doctor can heal or ameliorate these issues. By such methods, the fear of disintegration and death is just suppressed by modern people. Again, it was Doiverd who noted, I love this, he said, it is the uncomprehended revelation of God that fills humankind with fear and trembling. We can deny God. We can deny man is his image bearer. We can press ahead as a culture in a suicidal course, but it proves to be vanity for we are surrounded inside and out by the reality of God and his order. And we can suppress that revelation, but it's inescapable and it grips the being of every person. It generates guilt. It generates disquiet. It disturbs the conscience. And there is no recovery for our society till we recognize that whatever gains materially we have made, we have lost our soul. And as Christ warns us, there is a reckoning for that. What does Paul say in Galatians 6, 7? God is not mocked. What a man sows, he reaps. So our recourse must be repentance, personal and national. Let me conclude with reflecting briefly on the alternative that people have turned to uh, instead of the gospel. In, in the meantime, while the culture is decaying, and self-destructing around us, people look for these political, even magical solutions to their ills. The truth is so intolerable to fallen humanity, you see that when it does take hold of people, even then they still want to escape its claims. So rather, even though you will find people today that recognize we're in a total mess, 
they will still, you think to yourself, why will they not fall into the church? Why won't they just run to Christ? Well, because sinful man seeks to escape the total claims of God on our lives in every way. And it's into this pretentious and arrogantly overreaching world of cultural and political life that God calls Christians to actually be leaven, to be salt, to be light, to serve God and minister life and hope to our fellow people, to our fellow man in the public space, even if only at times that's through a kind of prophetic witness. Yes, it's in our personal evangelism, but it's also in our prophetic witness. And in this task, we have to recognize that all of life, including all cultural life, is shaped by the beliefs, by the religious worldviews of those who participate in it. This, this uh, is true for your friends in the workplace. It's true for political activists. It's too, true for people marching in their pride marches through the city. It doesn't matter what it is. Underlying those things is a religious worldview. And so that is what we have to be getting to and addressing ultimately. We can't just be moralizers. We can't just talk about human morality and that's wrong and the Bible's right. We have to understand the worldview just as Paul did in Acts 17 and engage people understanding that there are these beliefs that underlie their activities, their ideas that must be addressed. We've already seen that if we refuse to worship the living creator God, we don't seek to worship. So there's nobody in your life or mine that isn't a worshiper for a start. We will worship rather than the living God, some aspect of creation itself, something or some thing or some being is going to be absolutized. This idolatry or apostasy from the living God is what we spoke about earlier. And it begins in the heart, but it spreads then to touch everything else. And before a renewal of Christian life and culture is possible, this is going to have to be addressed. We're in the grip as well today, clearly, of God's historical judgments. And so when I look at the culture today, I don't just see one big disastrous mess. I actually see God's faithful, righteous judgment at work. Because Paul talks about people who turn to this kind of false worship as being handed over to a depraved mind. And when you find yourself unable to reason with somebody about something that's so glaringly obvious, you're often dealing with people whose minds are depraved and who are in desperate need of regeneration. God is judging our culture. And actually, judgment isn't something to be shunned. It's something to be welcomed. Because when God judges something, he's sweeping it aside to replace it with something else. A culture of death has no future. So there have to be a people who believe in a culture of life and live in terms of it to be there when God has swept this culture of death aside. Now, it's come to us today, this culture of death dressed in many outfits, many, many uh, new outfits, but it's really rooted in very ancient beliefs. Anthropologists in the past called the manner beliefs. They, that lay actually at the foundation of the disintegration of the human personality in pagan cultures. And actually in pagan culture, when you look back to pagan culture, you see that their beliefs were characterized by a fluidity of uh, reality between the personal and the impersonal. That was the hallmark of a nature religion. In other words, there was a mysterious life force that underlay absolutely everything. And millions of people in our culture today actually are paying homage to this life force, this divinity concept, on the yoga mat or in the science classroom, right? Where everything, or the alternative healers uh, surgery okay, where nature is deified as an endless stream of life that spontaneously arose and evolved from some undifferentiated absolute unity. And actually in the ancient world, it, in the Greco-Roman world, it was this belief that filled people with dread. They talked about it as fate, as blind fate. And actually in the light of fate, they promoted the nobility of suicide. Aren't we promoting exactly the same thing now? Isn't that basically what we're saying about euthanasia? There's a nobility to killing yourself. 
because it's all just fate anyway. There's no God who defines us, who has the right to begin and end life. When nature, you see, itself in various ways is absolutized, culture becomes decrepit and with actually with all of nature becoming somehow an aspect of the divine, so that so nature steps in for God, so we'll call that the divine per se, it's a re replacement deity, emerging from some original unity. If everything uh, that is, is God, is divine, and it all arose from some kind of original unity, then obviously the question becomes, how can differentiation take place at any level? How can you dif differentiate between truth and falsehood, between biological realities uh, and uh, ethical realities and artistic and juridical and moral? We even lose the most foundational distinction of all the differentiation between God and man. Do you see what I mean? If nature is divine, it's all there is, and it all arose from some original unity, what's the basis of true differentiation? Now, in the end, everything's just fluid, everything arose from some absolute oneness, and its goal is to return to that kind of a oneness. That's expressed in political philosophy today as well. So this mysterious world of chaotic forces can't give transcendent objective law. All that's left to the world of jurisprudence today is positive law, which emerges from the development of the reflective experience of the people, as Oliver Wendell Holmes, former Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, argued. In other words, um, uh, what he was trying to say there is that um, all you've got is people's human experience, and as people reflect on experience, you come up with laws. Who is it that's going to reflect on this experience and define culture for us by defining law and morality? Well, increasingly, a cultural elite. Cut off from accountability to God, cut off from accountability to Scripture of God's definition of the human person. This political salvation, this new priesthood, these Plato's philosopher kings become necessary. And again, this is completely logical. You need a new cultural elite. You need a new priesthood. If you don't have the church, who is going to teach the people? As we were hearing about, as we considered Ephesians recently. Who is going to teach the people? Well, you need a new priesthood. You need a new elite. Because chaos is not a workable political philosophy. And so in this world of lawless autonomy... Humanity needs salvation from all those fatalistic forces around us threatening to crush us. Who's going to provide that salvation? Well, increasingly, our society looks to absolutize the cultural sphere of the state as the agency that should be able to control the threat that man and nature are to man. The man is to himself. You see, this is why you're treated as a sort of ignorant pleb who doesn't know what is good for you by the political establishment today. You don't know what's good for you. You don't realize you need salvation by politics, but they do. And so they will create and mold and manipulate society in such a way to bring about that salvation. Even if it means saying, we're going to take your children off you if your child says that uh, they're not comfortable in their body and you don't support that and give them therapy and drugs, then we may take them off you as, ch as, as a child abuser. So, it is to the state that our idolatrous man today has largely delegated his freedom. And this political doctrine rests typically on beliefs that flatly contradict what God says about humanity. Now, I'm not suggesting that every single thing about the culture is evil. But what I am saying uh, is that they refuse to locate evil in the heart of man. So they'll say that evil is out there. I mean... Perhaps there's never been a political age when there's been more moral pontification than there is in our modern society. Taking the moral high ground, but it's usually about all the wrong things. Because instead of locating sin and evil in the heart of the human person, the environment, the spheres of social order like the family, the church, private property, as well as other structures of alleged inequality are identified as the problem. They supposedly war against this original equality and unity of the human race. So evil is seen as those actual institutions, those biblical institutions, those biblical definitions that are supposedly holding up the salvation of the human person. In this view, then, human beings are perfectible by political technique, uh, which is really just a repackaged world of 
magic, a plastic world. We're not beings made in God's image, fallen into sin and idolatry, who need to be restrained from evil by re revealed moral law, who need to be renewed by Jesus Christ. We're malleable. We may even become transhuman, posthuman. We may shed our humanity, merge with our technology, and become cyborgs. That's not an exaggeration. That is a uh, credible philosophy today among the technocrats and the futurists and even politicians, sponsored by very large corporations, multinational corporations like Google. There's even colleges set up for the promotion of transhumanism. God is thought to be brought down to the level of man. Man is raised to the level of God. And if the authority of families, parents, churches, pastors, private businesses, guilds, and associations are eroded, if we can abolish all of them, and all that is left is this political elite which will interpret the experience of the people, perhaps then we can abolish God himself and all transcendent authority. The social cost and destructiveness of this liberation project is all around us and it's, it's actually beyond our full comprehension really. You think about the debt loads of modern states today. The modern welfare states in Europe and North America buckling under the financial reality of a counterfeit exodus, a counterfeit freedom, a counterfeit salvation. If the human race had learned anything by now from our historical experience, you would think that it would be a recognition that if we reject God and the image of God in man, it will lead to the endless defacing and destruction of that image and the steady decay of our culture as the political sphere overreaches itself and tries to play the Messiah's role in their lives. Look at the 20th century and the atheistic political philosophies that dominated the age. Millions and millions and millions of people murdered, slaughtered, as man denied the image of God in man. You see, we cannot find the solution to our malady within nature itself, within the creation itself. That's where man looks for it. He can't find it there. Human beings cannot be remade or renewed by technique, and they will never be perfected until Christ establishes his kingdom in all its fullness. The contemporary religious illusion, then, that the human ego has the same absolute existence as God himself, where we succumb to this original lie that we will be as gods, in seeking ourselves and our God in the temporal world of experience, we have lost ourselves in the abyss. We have absolutized that which is relative and thereby comprehensible only with reference back to God and his word. But I cannot leave you on such a depressing note, so let me close with this thought. These are illusions. These, these, this cultural religion is an illusion. It's a powerful illusion. It's a powerful deception. But it is an illusion because in the end we are God's creatures. We cannot escape God's revelation in everything. We cannot escape God's law. We cannot escape his norms. Scripture tells us that the human eye, the person, is nothing in and of itself but lives only in reference to the creative power and defining word of God. In fact, true knowledge, even of ourselves, is dependent, as John Calvin made clear, on the true knowledge of God. The foundation of true knowledge and of true knowledge of God is right relationship with God. It's the love of God. This is the ethical aspect, the first commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And since God is to be loved so wholeheartedly, his image bearer is going to be loved as well, which is the second commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. You see that? You see, if you love God, you're going to love his image bearer which is why the commandments are summarized in love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Nowhere in the Christian view can such a love lead to the destruction of that image in a gender fluid confusion, in the redefinition of God's creational institutions of marriage, for example, or of the murder of our neighbor in the womb, in age, in sickness, or in despair in the name of human dignity. The simple truth is that without love for God and a recognition of his word revelation to us in Christ and in scripture, we're not only not able to love our neighbor, we can't even identify them. We find that we cannot answer the most elementary question today without Christ. What is 
a person. What is a human person? Permit me to cite Doyover just one last time. He cuts to the heart of the matter. He says this, the question, what is man, who is he, cannot be answered by man himself. However, it has been answered by God's word revelation, which uncovers the religious root and center of human nature in its creation, fall into sin and redemption by Jesus Christ. Man lost true self-knowledge when he lost the true knowledge of God. But all idols of the human selfhood, which man in his apostasy has devised, break down when they are confronted with the word of God, which unmasks their vanity and nothingness. It is this word alone which, by its radical grip, can bring about real reformation of our view of man and of our view of the temporal world. You know, we actually are in possession of this word. That's the amazing thing. And with it, the true knowledge of God, the true knowledge of the human person. And on that basis, we are able to pursue true culture, true community, the kingdom of God. With a transcendent reference for life and thought, political and cultural reality can proceed faithfully in their various spheres, grounded in a true understanding of life, of the life of humankind. The true word reveals that human beings are not merged with divinity, a primitive life force where law and social order are just emergent properties of nature, where we have to capture nature as the man gods and build our own parliament of man. No, that idolatrous vision requires this coercion, this coerced collectivization to realize community. It undermines, actually, in the end, both the individual and community. But in the Christian view, true community and communion rests on an inner bond, an inner bond, the grace of God, and then loyalty to God and his life and freedom bringing word. So we must continue to serve the cause of Christ to the best of our ability. We have to pray for those in authority. We have to seek the good of our fellow man. We have to prophetically witness against idolatry in its various forms and pursue righteousness, truth, beauty, justice in every sphere of life. And don't expect to be loved by everyone in the process. We're not going to be loved and appreciated by everyone. But this is the victory that overcomes the world, the Apostle John says, even our faith. It's been almost a century now where our culture has been progressively pursuing the death of man as man. The death of man as man. And so we're surrounded by dead men, dead in their trespasses and sins, says Paul in Ephesians 2. But the Lord Jesus Christ assures us, he says, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. We can actually be confident of victory in the long run in this battle because an apostate culture of death has no future against the Lord of life. The gospel tells us that Jesus Christ, both fully man and fully God, is sovereign Lord, and he alone is worthy of worship and praise and glory. And so the prophet tells us of the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. And that resurrection life and power not only means gospel culture amongst us as it spreads as leaven through the whole oath in society, it means finally that all men and nations shall bow at the feet of Jesus. Thank you very much.